I don't know what I am anymore. I'm not sure I'm the same guy <laughs> post pre during COVID. I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm not the, I don't know what I am. I, I feel like, uh, I feel you know, we're, we're stationary a lot of times. So, mm-hmm. Well, that's not, uh, that, that, that makes perfect. That's a really good starting point. Let me tell you, because your book starts with you being half Jewish and I don't yeah. even know if you said the other half, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Like it was rare back in the sixties and seventies. So you never, yeah, Irish, you never, Irish, oh, that, Catholic. that sounds right. I mean, like you look, you look yeah. the part. Yeah. So that you never really fit in according to yourself, right? You never really fit the mold anyway. I don't know if you didn't fit in, but you didn't fit the mold. I didn't fit the mold, and uh, I was just talking about that. Um, mm-hmm. So, yes, uh, it was a Jewish neighborhood, very Jewish neighborhood. Um, it's called the Five Towns. It's a very famous suburb in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it was the prototypical Jewish suburb in America. And... Uh, uh, it's not anymore. It's it's Orthodox actually now. Oh, like heart, like Orthodox Jewish, hardcore Orthodox Jewish. Oh like, wow, they don't they don't they're very hardcore, very hardcore. They all the those people that I grew up with either moved to New York City or they moved to the North Shore of Long Island, which is like uh, I don't know if you know any of this, but like um, old old Westbury or Brookville or you know like Roslyn that kind of thing. Okay, but. So, yes, I was different. So I had Jewish friends. And um, so the Irish, the few Irish that were in the neighborhood, there was a section of town where the Irish and Italian lived. And they were like firemen and cops, you know, guys, blue collar guys. So the notion that someone that was Irish could be with these Jewish guys and, you know, be sort of sticky and literate and whatever, you know, was a shock to the Jewish guys. And, and then of course the Irish, few Irish guys that I knew didn't want any part of, (laughs) of me, you know, and, uh, I actually enjoyed it. I have to say, I enjoyed it, um, being a little different. I, I did. I, I, so I could see I, that. I sort of, yeah, I sort of enjoyed it, but I definitely, definitely was a little bit of an outsider, just a little bit. I wonder if that's where you get your, I mean, you write in the book, it's better to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. I know neither you or I made that up, but I, I'm figuring growing up as an outsider is a great way to develop that mindset, right? Because you grow up going, well, if I don't fit in here and I don't fit in there, I'm just going to do whatever I want. And if people get mad at me, then I'll just fix it later. Yeah. I'm not sure I had that sort of long range planning. Of course you didn't have but... the planning, but that's how it, it develops. <laughs> it develops initially like sort of intuitively, yeah. right? Yes, it does. Yeah. It the does. crap you put and... in the book, you think of afterwards and you go, ah, yeah, that sounds good. I'm going to write that down. That's what I was doing the whole time. Well, but the, in the that's meantime... actually, yeah, that's, that's a good one. I actually learned that later in life and and, say, and unfortunately that is a truism and it is a slick little saying, but it is actually true. Why do you think it's unfortunate? I feel like that's, I I mean, do you think it's a big deal that you have to be that way? You know, so many rules, uh, that are so important to us, uh, you know, if when pushed, you could break those rules and then nothing happens and you know your life is better or enriched or whatever the whatever happens and you think to yourself uh gee you know why don't i do that more <laughs> or, or and let's fast forward to the president of the united states right mm-hmm. and see that he has taken that to a whole other level right or just the mindset you know uh and uh so 
here we are. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for better or for worse, I mean, the, the debatable. Well, that's a, that leads into my next question here, which is what are the limits of that? Because you yourself, and we'll get to this later on in, in, in the notes here, because I did, I read the whole book cover to cover. I really enjoyed it. I didn't think I'd like a book about a guy who started a shoe store, which is what it initially seemed to me. And now I'm yeah, like, this guy's like a, what, it's a good, what it is. it's a good brand. You know, it's a good story. You're a good storyteller. And I think the fact that you read it yourself makes it even more, uh, more fun and interesting. So yeah. where do we run up against the limits of that? Like 2020 hindsight, what's the limit of better to ask for forgiveness than permission? Oh boy. Yeah. You know, you're asking me some deep questions, but I, I would say that I, I wish I wasn't such a rule breaker and, and I'm not proud of a lot of things that I did. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we're getting into some things, but, um, I mean, look what's going on right now. Uh, so many people, you know, like what's going on. There are lots of millions of people that that believe that the election was rigged. Mm -hmm. And because he's just saying, I didn't lose. Right. I didn't lose. It was stolen from me. You know, like kind of like, you know, the beginnings of that was like Muhammad Ali did that in the first Joe Frazier fight. You know, like he said, I really won the fight. Mm -hmm. I this was before you were born, Jordan, but it was a big deal. Ali Frazier won was a big deal. But, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think it's unhealthy. I think it's unhealthy. And I think, you know, I, I worry about my children. I want to say to my children, I know I'm being a little crazy here. No, no, it's okay. I, I want to say to my kids, losing does not mean you're a loser. It means you had a contest and you came up short, but you gave it your all. You left it all on the field and you look your opponent in the eye and you say, good game. And you, how you, how you come back from something is what makes you a man and makes you a winner, mm -hmm. you know, because there is nobody that doesn't go through life with some upsets you know, no one. And so I want to say to my young boy that I have and love, I want to say, no, you're, it's actually, you're not a loser. And it's how you, it's how you act, you know, in the face of, you know, coming up short, you know, that's what makes you a winner. I really believe that. So I feel like that message is being distorted right now. And, uh, you know, it's, I think that the president thinks he's a loser. I really do think mm -hmm. he thinks that. But if he did great. He got 72 million votes. The guy did great. And there was a plague in the land. And he still got 72 million votes. He came up short, which it's a miracle that it was that close, given what was going on in the United States. So uh, I want to say that to the president and hug him. <laughs> And say, dude, you did it. You did it. You ran a great election. You just came up short. And now be a man, help the country, turn the key car keys over to the guy, <laughs> you know, tell him what you think you could do better, at, you know, like help the country. I feel like that's the best stuff, you know, and I feel like we're losing that. You know, like George Bush, George Bush, the elder got his ass whooped by Bill Clinton and he wrote a letter to him when Clinton, like anything you need, you know, when he took over, he left a letter on his desk. Like you fought the good fight and anything you need, I'm here and I'm praying for you. You, yeah. you know, you're running things like that's good stuff. That's like a legendary letter. In fact, I think every, almost every president has done that in the last, you know, whatever century or two yeah, leaves a letter for the next guy, which must be pretty cool. Imagine coming into your office and there's a letter from the previous president of the United States being like, I know we've, we've, we stirred the pot, but like, give me a call if you need to figure out how to open the trunk in this beast because it's really, there's some tricks in the White House. The the toilet jiggles in the upstairs bathroom. You know, like that's the kind of stuff you want to see coming in when you're taking the jo hardest job in the world. Yes, yes, I agree. And I, and I wish that we, that kind of stuff happened and that's good stuff. And that needs to be, you know, that needs to be 
pushed again, right? Because I think I think that that's what we need, and got to, you know, the damage from this these last few years. Everybody is in their own camp, you know, and there's no, and there and there's no, you know, it's just tough, you know, and I think we'll get back on the book, but I want to say also that I think there are lots of ideas out there that are, that the answers to are not left or right wing. I think that like wise men have to get together to fix a lot of stuff in the country. And like, it's good to have different opinions and kind of figure it out. And I think we're losing that. I I think we're losing that. Yeah. We're shutting out good opinions by tricks and, shutting people down and not calling Congress in because yeah. we don't want to vote on this. And it's like, if your idea can't, can't win on the merits, what do you, what are you really doing here? Yeah. Look, I know you, you said you think you're ADHD. Let me tell you as one, uh, ADHD diagnosis to another un, maybe an undiagnosis, uh, undiagnosed person, you, probably all entrepreneurs that are successful have it at some level, whether or not they ever had to take medication for it or they self-medicated like, like you did. Um, th- there's definitely an advantage to having ADHD in business, I think. And you, you mentioned you had four screens you had to pay attention to all the time with various things uh, in your business. But I'm curious, you must have had to hire around your weaknesses uh, or the weakness of being able to focus on one thing for a long time. What advantages do you find in business from being kind of hyperactive and having your focus go from one thing to another really rapidly? I think it was the secret to my success, frankly, was hiring um, hiring around my weaknesses, hmm. for sure. I was initial, I just had a very uh, keen awareness that I was a complete idiot at certain things. I just knew it, you know, like, I'm, I'm like, I didn't fool myself. I said, like, I'm good at this and this. And I'm, I'm really bad at that. Uh... I remember one of my first hires was an accountant. Generally right? a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Selling, I was selling a lot of shoes. I had a lot of good ideas, mm-hmm. you know, running a business. And I, very shortly, I was introduced to this Indian fellow. We were so different. And, uh, you know, he would organize things and pay the bills, mostly pay the bills. <laughs> I would never pay a bill. I'm laughing like because would... I married my accountant. She's my wife. Oh. And it's a great move. I got to tell you. It's a great move. Marry your accountant. <laughs> just... I would have married this guy. If I wasn't, you know, I'm not gay, but if I was, I would have married him. Uh, so I, you know, that's another thing with ADD. That's another big thing that I didn't really touch on is the bill paying thing. Like you just, it's not that you don't want to pay. It's just that you can't handle it. It's like, you just, it's like, we'll do that next week. I'll pay that next week. You know, and there was no rhyme or reason to it other than control or whatever it was, you know, not to pay some bill. You're going to pay it or you're not going to pay it. But, you know, so he came in and all the bills were paid and I was able to, you know, have this maniacal sort of force, but all the while paying my bills. And building a real business. You're like the Tasmanian devil going through the office and he's like behind you with the little sweeper and the little bucket, just like making sure that things don't fall off the wall. That's actually very, yeah, that's actually good. But I was lucky. That was just a lucky break. And uh, so, yeah, he, I remember him just, there used to be a TV show again before you were born called mash i know mash how old do you think i am by the way you're like what 35 i'm 40 know, i'm 40 okay. yeah all right so mash and in Ma- it was the big it was a huge tv show and, and there was this guy named radar and radar would put all and he would put all the things the requisition forms under the captain's nose to sign you know the captain was just like drinking and acting stupid and he'd say oh you gotta sign this and then he would just just sign it and radar would bring him the things and, you know, stuff to keep the base, you know, supplies and medicine, you know, it was, it was, I always felt like, yeah, that's the guy I need, Radar. Radar yeah. O'Reilly, his name was. Radar O'Reilly, yeah, that's a very vietnam area nickname as well, like back when Radar was an original kind of, kind of thing. Your dad yanked you out of college, and I, I, you said in the book, it was impossible for me, I just couldn't function like an adult. And, and it's funny to look at that now, and I think, this is me, it's weird now because I'm super responsible and organized. I somehow outgrew it. I wonder if you feel like you outgrew that or if you are just better at hiring around your weaknesses now than you were before. 
I still do it. I mean, it's different now. We're in a different place because the whole, you know, everything has changed now and pretty much the company runs better without me than even though I'm still <laughs> working every day. I was going to say, you said you were in your office. What do you do? You just show up and they're like, ah, oh, Steve's here. Give, oh, him, God, give him something to sign. <laughs> God, that asshole's here again. Uh, you know, I focus on, I, I come to work and I focus on the shoes and I focus on ideas and, and, and I have great people that, you know, are, are uh, kind of running stuff. It's great. It's, I'm so lucky. Um, <clears throat> but yes, it is a, it's a key thing. And knowing what, you, I always say, knowing what you don't know is a very big gift when you're, you know, in life, um, running a business or, you know, knowing what you don't know is so huge. Now, I know a lot of guys and girls mm -hmm. who don't have that gift, who don't have, or they think they're supposed to know something. Yeah, and they try and figure everything out and do it themselves. Yes, they think they're supposed to. You know, that's an interesting thing. You say, well, I'm, I'm the head of this, so I'm supposed to know all this stuff. So that, that gets people in trouble. You're, you know, that's a, that's a trouble spot for people. It can sink your business. I mean, imagine if you're the chairman of Google and you think you know how to write a search algorithm and you're ignoring the other 3000 business units that you have. I mean, it's, you'll never get that far. You know, I think sometimes that it happens to people, you know, when they're very, very successful and they start to think they know everything, you know, because they're, they're at the top of their industry. And, you know, then they start to opine about other things. And yeah, there's a there's a, a term for this. And I wish I could remember the name, but it's something where it, the concept where it'll come to me after the show, where when you're an expert in one thing and you're really high up, like if you're a, a doctor, you're a medical doctor, and then somebody asks you about what you think about politics, you will potentially, not always, but potentially have a very strong opinion about it. And you go, well, I'm a, do I'm a medical doctor. You know, I'm a, I'm a brain surgeon. Of course, I'm going to be good at all these other things that I'm sort of only moderately good at or even terrible at. Uh, it, you might know that you can't fix your car yourself, but you don't necessarily know that you can't sell shoes or design shoes. That's great. And the one I use, that's a great one. The one I use is, well, can you imagine if you walked into a cockpit and you thought that you were supposed to know how to fly on the first day? You know, like you walked in and said, why don't I know how to do this? And you start beating yourself up for not knowing. And that's the one that I, I kind of use as a guide. It's easy to do that. When you think of a radically different skill, like flying a plane, you go, of course, I don't need to know that. But if you think... Well, I design shoes so I should be able to balance the books of a shoe company. You're actually choosing two skills that are just as different. It just Absolutely feels Absolutely the same thing. Yeah. It's really so that's why the plane analogy works for me, you know, very well. Yeah. Yeah. They're different things and a lot of founders get in trouble like that. When you were younger, we talked about self-medication, quaaludes. I know you got into cocaine and, and things like that. You had paranoia. You're so addictive. I imagine you got a lot of work done at that point in time um, just because of the nature of cocaine and working in New York. I used to work on Wall Street. So I'll let your, you know, you can fill in the blanks. You know, some of those guys uh, and they get a lot of work done, uh, but they're, you know, they're dysfunctional. I've heard you say creativity has to make money. Otherwise it's boring. That sounds pretty controversial. It's not that I disagree, but most creatives don't make money from their creative work, right? Do you think that those people are just wasting their time? Well, first of all, it's, it, this is, that's not true for everybody. It's just true for me. Okay. Yeah. That's all. I want to say that there's, there's plenty of starving artists that are not boring and, you know, or they don't think they're boring and they're probably not. And I have a lot of respect for them myself. But for me, part of the creative process was hitting the register. You know, that's part of the thing for me. That's, it's all part of the same thing. It's not enough just to me make a great shoe. It has to sell to lots mm -hmm. of girls. And hitting the register, was, like ching, that, is that the sound you hear in your head when you're thinking about it? Yeah. 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 And I know that that's the case with a lot of artists. And I've actually heard, you know, Mac Paul McCartney talk about this. You know, everybody thinks they're the Beatles. They were just these, you know, 
you know, these artists that didn't care about money or whatever, and and nothing could be further from the truth. And and they were no less creative, by the way. But Paul would say, and I heard him say this on an interview that he'd say, oh, him and John would write a song and say, oh, we just we just got a swimming pool. Yeah. That's another car. You know, like they understood that. And uh, so, and it, it's not even materialistics. It's just part of the the game, you know. I think a lot of people are are motivated by that, not just purely by money, but the the financial success is part of the game, right? You got to look the part. You live in New York, so you know exactly what that's like. There's a lot of people that they they only care about what money can buy them in terms of status it's not even necessarily materialistic or it's the only measuring stick that they have because of the way that they were raised potentially i think that's it i think it's the uh, it's the metaphor for love or winning mm -hmm. yeah or, or something it's it's really crazy and and it's so and i'll tell you what's boring listening to a guy with money talking about how money doesn't mean anything <laughs> yeah i know i, I try and <laughs> that's fucking boring i try and reel that in sometimes because i'm like watch there's you know there's college kids who, who are coming into the worst job market in like a century and they're like jordan tell me more with steve madden about why i don't need money while i'm living on my mom's dirty couch in a garage however what is true what is true is that money cannot buy you happiness. Mm -hmm. That is true. Money can make you, I mean, money can make you very comfortable, even if you're miserable. It can make you comfortable. Now, there's no question that you can buy extra blankets and lots of shit. But, uh, you know, that do will not buy you happiness. That is something that you have to get somewhere else. Well, you tried and certainly uh, some of the other guys in the book tried that. And we'll get to that in, in a little bit. I, I want to back up just a smidge because you did. You worked at, at a lot of places. You go through a couple jobs you had in the book, but you're drinking, you're partying. Like I said, you get yanked out of college and you started your own wholesale business. And it sounds like in part you started the business because you were not really functioning well in R sort of regimented environments because of ADHD or possibly because of the drugs or possibly both, it actually sounds kind of miserable, right? Like you're, you're not starting a business because you're called to it. You're starting a business because you're being pushed out of a lot of the other jobs that you had. Is that accurate? It's, it's close to the truth. That is close. That is accurate somewhat. You know, I was sort of unemployable, you know, and, uh, and, but I, always wanted to be in my own business, you know, ever since uh, I was a kid. And I always fantasized about it. And I was just, uh, I had, I worked for some amazing people. Some of the jobs in the shoe business that I, I worked for incredible teachers. And I took a lot of their, you know, a lot of their knowledge and, and, went into business. I'm grateful to them. Very much so. There's a story in the book, and I, I can't remember if this was also in a trailer, but I think this is just so, this this sort of puts you in a, in a nutshell, if it's possible to put you in a nutshell. You're walking down the street, or you're driving down the street, or you're being driven down the street in New York, and you stop a woman on the street and you say, hey, where'd you get those shoes? And you, uh, what did you offer to drive her to another shoe store if you could buy the shoes off of her feet? What's going on there? I've done that so many times. <laughs> I can't, I don't even know what you're talking about, but I stop people all the time. And uh, in a supermarket, in the street, uh, I see a girl wearing something and it looks great. I've even stopped people and I said, where'd you get that shoe? And they say, Steve Madden. Oh. <laughs> How about that one? Yeah. So that's happened to me a few times, but I, I am very, I like to see the, the street sort of, the way they wear something and it gives me an idea and uh, I always, it's a real turn on for me, you know, creatively to see uh, a certain woman wearing a certain shoe. What do you do with the shoe that you buy? Do you just take it apart or something like that? Because I'm trying to think why keep it instead of just taking a picture of it, for example. Well, that's a good question, but it's just, it's, it's often not copyable it's just the attitude of the shoe mm -hmm. it's just something that you just want to capture that spirit in the that 
is going on in the whole outfit, you know. That makes sense. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you just, it's almost like a marker or something, but. D these women must have thought you were like a complete creep though, right? Like at first he's hitting on me. Now he's like trying to buy him. my shoes. I just want the shoes. Then he's I'm like, I'll hitting. drive you to another store. I'm care. not getting in the car. <laughs> when I, when I meet women, I'm like looking at their feet. I'm not even looking at them. I'm like, I sh like literally my first move is always to look at their feet. It's just obsessed. And you get like eyes yeah. up here, buddy. No, that your shoes. I'm looking at your shoes. <laughs> yeah. No, I've, I've been like, please. I, I, I'm so sorry. I just want to know what now, especially I'm older and, and everything. And, but people go, I just had one in East Hampton. I was in East Hampton and she said, and I went, please, I, I, I'm so sorry. She goes, I know who you are. Mm -hmm. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's funny. Anyway. I saw you coming down the street and I wondered if you were going to ask about my shoes. I've heard about this on the internet. Yeah. I've heard about this. <laughs> Whenever you weren't selling shoes, you were hanging out in the shoe department at Macy's. And this is from the book watching women react to shoes. Nordstrom's, Macy's, Bloomingdale's, all the stores. So that not going to lie, that's still a little bit unusual behavior, right? Nobody else is doing this. I, I'm so there, you know, the, it's an old sort of shoe doggy kind of. I think they probably did it, you know, maybe a hundred years ago or something, but uh, fifty years ago. But I like to see. I love stores, and I would hang out at my own store. That's one of the reasons why I opened uh, my store. So I'd hang out. Mm -hmm and see what they were gravitating to. And I can't speak for other people, but that was always something that I, and still do. I just was in my store in North, North Miami, Florida, and just hanging out. It's not as busy now because of COVID. Yeah. But. Do you tell the store you're coming in? Like, do you call ahead or do you just show, you're like driving by and you're like, I'm going to pop in there and see if I get helped right away or something like that. They know who I am. They do. We yeah. Got loops in the store, but. Oh, that makes sense. I don't really like that sort of idea of uh, undercover boss. I don't really yeah. fancy that. The, the, the employees are under enough stress; they don't need to wonder. They, they're they don't you know they don't need to wonder if you're going to pop in. I think that's so true, and I really I always found that show kind of offensive. To be honest with you, I, it's hard enough working in a store. It is really you're dealing with the public, and you're on your feet, and and uh, you know whether it's my store or Zara, or, you know clothes, you know, whatever, those people are in the trenches mm -hmm. of fashion business. And I always have a lot of sort of Rachmanis for them. Do you know that word? I, I don't, but it sounds like <laughs> Hebrew or something. What is it? Rachmanis? <laughs> Rachmanis. It's a Yiddish word. Yiddish word. Okay. That I'm the sense. only Irish guy that you know that speaks Yiddish. Yeah, that's probably true. You might, even in New York, that's probably true. Yeah. Rachmanis is a, it's just like, I have like not pity, but like I feel for them. Rachmanis. Yeah. It's a good word that, to learn. That is a good word. I, yeah, and I know Jewish friends. I know a lot of, dude, I'm Jewish. I should know this, you know? You're Jewish? Yeah. Yeah. You, know the, the uh, most, you look like as Irish as Patty's pig. You know why? It's because say. my dad is Ukrainian German and my mom's side is Jewish. So I'm only like, you know, I. Oh, you're only a half breed I'm like a, me? I'm a half breed like you. That's right. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't even know. I didn't even know I was Jewish, quote unquote, until I was like 13 years old because I, it, we never did any of the Jewish stuff when I was growing up. It didn't really matter. I never did. I never did any of the Jewish stuff. The, the thing is, uh, just uh, the thing is that my grandparents who were Jewish, they lived with us for a couple of years on their way to Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, on their way to Florida, very uh, accurate. Yeah. The subtle, yeah. yes, on their way to Florida. Shh. On their way to Florida, and uh, for a couple of years, it's a long did, trip. Two years, no, it was, and it was great. You know, it was great. I remember a lot about it, and they spoke a lot of Yiddish, and I learned a lot of words. And I, I used to, I loved, I hung out with them. They were interesting. They were interesting people, and they were very smart, and you know, readers and. I really dug them, and uh, and uh, you know it was a very uh, it was cool. You know, it's a it was a nice relationship, and uh, most people don't have it as much. I think the world kind of changed. 
you know, I feel like well, grandparents don't always don't usually live with yeah. grandkids. It was anymore. very c- sort of common. Yeah. You know, back in the day. And uh, yeah, now that's changed. Now the young people leave the nest and then old people go to wherever. My mother died. Uh, she would if my mother was alive, she'd be 98. Oh, wow. She died uh, seven years ago. And my mom was a little girl during the Depression, with, you know, and she lived with her cousins. Wow. <laughs> she lived. Yes. She lived with her first cousin. Imagine. Man. Yeah. She had one brother and she lived with. I mean, life was like that. I mean, people because they they came out of the 20s, these big apartments. Right. The roaring 20s. And then all of a sudden everything dried up. So they had these massive apartments and they filled them up with relatives. Yeah. <laughs> and so her first cousin was like an aunt, an aunt or an aunt, whatever Jeez. you would say. Yeah, like 30 people in a building or 20 people in a building. <clears throat> yeah. But um, but yeah, my grandparents, that was a so they would say things like Rachmanis. Rachmanis, yeah. You got Spilkis. You've heard that one. That right? one, what is, is that like chutzpah? No. No. That's chutzpah is chutzpah. Okay. Chutzpah is you've got guts. Right. He's got chutzpah. He's got balls. He's got chutzpah. Uh, but Spilkis, it, the literal translation is ants in the pants. Oh, that's so useful too. He's got Spilkis. You've got, that's why got you know Spilkes. that. You got Spilkis. You got Spilkis right now trying to keep you in the frame. I, I got Spilkis. <laughs> I, I got Spilkis. Yes, it's a great word. The Yiddish is such a great language. It, it really is. And it's a dying, well, maybe it's not dying. I th- it oh, was. it is. It, it definitely is. It definitely is. Yeah, like, it's, it's not going anywhere anytime soon because of Orthodox Jews, like the ones that live in your old neighborhood. But it's definitely, there's no, if there are any Yidd- Yiddish schools and things like that, they're just like religious schools. It's it's pretty isolated. It's pretty insular. It's, it's probably nobody's first language. Um, you know what? You, you hanging out in your store reminds me of... You ever hear that story of is it Sam Walton at Walmart and he they called the police on him once in like Brazil or something because he was he was on the floor like measuring the aisles and stuff and they thought they had this mentally ill guy in the store and they it turns out he's like this billionaire or at the time you know hundred million dollars whatever a hundred years ago and he was like oh I just want to see if they know something that I don't with these narrower aisles maybe they can fit more items in the store and da-da. so he was just like obsessed with every element of the business and he liked hanging out in his stores just to see how it worked and how everything worked and try to optimize everything and be in every level of the job. It's just a funny visual to see you or to think about you like lurking in the corner at a Macy's and women looking at you sidelong, like, does that guy work here? And the salespeople be like, no, no, that's Stevie. He, he hangs out here because he loves watching women try on shoes. I, I identify with Sam Walton. I love Sam Walton's story. And, uh, you know, I identify with that. I mean, he just believed in his company and he built it and one store after another. And I love the Sam Walton story and I I admire him so much. And uh, a lot of great entrepreneurs, uh, you know, they did stuff back in the day. They worked, the, they were on the floor of their store. Mm-hmm. There's famous stories about, you know, Mr. Marshall Field, you know, being on the floor in Chicago and there is no more Marshall Field. Oh, is that Please out of wait. business? I guess well, it is. No, no, it's owned by, it's owned by Macy's. That makes sense. That makes so sense. the Marshall Field famous Chicago store is now called Macy's. So, um, but uh, yeah, I identify with that very much. And I always felt like his spirit, Frank. You know, it's funny, but that kind of hands-on, silly founder. <laughs> yeah, the eccentric founder yeah. who shows yeah. up and, and is measuring the aisle ways. And it's like, don't, that would be me. don't mind him. He's the owner. We don't question him trying to buy shoes off customers that walk in the store to buy our shoes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Tell me about meeting this guy, Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street. For people who don't know, right? People who don't know who he is, they made the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. He's essentially this like, sort of hardcore sales shyster, you know, sells bad stocks. Yeah. Now he's, he was actually, uh, he was actually quite a brilliant guy. Um, um, he was actually, yeah, he was actually quite intelligent and, uh, he just chose this, 
uh, you know, this boiler room thing. Yeah, like and, a dark uh, path. But I'll tell you about him anyway. Yeah. So they raised money for companies. And, uh, you know, I never had a lot of money. So he, you know, through my childhood friend, they raised money for my company. And they were quite dynamic. And it was really something. It was very much like the movie captured a lot of the spirit of what they were. And, uh, you know, I got involved with them. Um, on doing some other IPOs. And that's how I got in trouble. Uh, but he was a very charismatic, very, very brilliant guy. And of course, our relationship fractured. Uh, and, uh, but I don't have, you know, I don't have a lot of regret. I mean, other than I did stupid things, I'm certainly not gonna, I'm certainly not gonna blame him for it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, do you think 2020 hindsight you should have known at the time, or was he just really magnetic and you weren't even thinking about it? I was greedy. And um, I was young and greedy and fearful. And he was charismatic. And I never met anybody like him. And, uh, you know, he kind of like s sort of was outside all the fears, you know, all the sort of middle class fears that. I had, you know, like, I could never be a rich man, mm -hmm. you know, or I, you know, I thought I was good at what I did, but I never thought I would be, you know, this guy, Steve Madden, right? Yeah. And he was able to, you know, go beyond that and reach for the stars. And he did some bad stuff, but, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, in a way that it was, I mean, he made some mistakes and, but he, but it doesn't take away from the fact that he had some stuff that I really admired. And, uh, you know, as I made mistakes, uh, and, and so, yes, I do regret, I regret some of the stuff, some of the things I did. And I raised, I got involved with these guys and, I knew it was shady. It was too good to be true. <laughs> it was too good to be true. But so what they were doing for people who are confused, they were they they buy companies or pieces of companies and then they they convince people through like shady marketing tactics and lies and things like that to invest money so that the stock price gets inflated and then at the top which they coordinate, they sell off their share of the company at the at the all-time high for that stock and dump it. So it's called a pump and dump. And they do that. And then everybody else who they convince to buy through the marketing and the phone stuff, the boiler room stuff, those people lose their investment because the stock is actually worthless. It's been artificially inflated, right? Is that more or less how it works? Yeah, it's, it's sort of the greater fool theory. Mm -hmm. It's a Ponzi scheme. You know, you just keep selling the stock. Now, here's the thing about it. So most of the companies were shitty little companies, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like a bagel company, and karate company, and and then they, here comes Steve Madden, tiny little company, Steve Madden. You know, I was doing nothing. They invested in me and were part of the scheme. In the meantime, I'm designing one hot shoe after another. The girls are going crazy over my shoes. I'm building a business simultaneous to this boiler room, you know, Strat and Oakmont. And lo and behold, I built this amazing company. And I think I was the only stock they took public that, ended up being successful. Yeah, it was like an accident that, that they bought a, a share of your company and it didn't just bomb after that. Yeah, right? it was. It was kind of an accident. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I learned a lot from those guys. And I learned a lot from Jordan and Danny, you know. I learned a lot from them. The way they, you know, the good bits, you know, the good stuff. Like what? And, Give me an example. You know, just the relentless singleness of purpose, the believing in themselves, believing that they were the best, believing that the impossible was possible. They did have that, you know, when they came to me and they said they were going to raise me $600,000, that would be like me calling you up to Jordan. I'm going to send you 60 million bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like that, like what? 600,000. I mean, I never had more than like 30 grand ever together in my life, you know, you know, ever you yeah. know, savings account, maybe grew to, you know, whatever, but like, so that, and then they took me public and it was, 
you know, they raised nine million bucks. Was, the numbers were that kind of thing. You know, just this, these dreams. Uh, Do you think you got addicted to money like you were previously addicted to other substances? Was it the same thing? It's not quite the same thing, but certainly. I mean, you're not putting it up your nose or whatever or popping it in pill form, but like you get that same rush, right? Or, or similar. Yeah. Same rush. Yeah. Yeah. It's a money thing for sure. How did that break? Because it's seen, or do you still have it, but it keep, you keep it on a leash, you know? Well, I was punished, you know, and, and then, you know, I've been, at the same time, I've been very fortunate. I had a very successful company, and and uh, but I was punished very severely, deservedly. I want to say, deservedly. I paid all the money back, millions and millions of dollars, uh, and uh, so I learned that I will keep it on a leash. No, you know, your addictions do pop up, you know. Uh, but fear is healthy. Like the fear of getting in trouble is a very healthy fear. Yeah. You know, you know, like it, you, this, like we all lose our temper, want to kill somebody, but like, you know, the fear of shooting someone, the fear of the trouble is, stops, keeps order in the society. Right. Otherwise guys would be rocking around with guns, shooting each other. If there was no, if there was no consequences. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah, of course. I, I just, I know that, so being punished for something doesn't always keep, you know, an addiction per se. No, at, no, it doesn't. Day, it right? doesn't. I'm, I'm just trying to say what uh, I've learned in my recovery that, uh, you know, that there are, there's other things and it's not the end of the world. And right now, one of the things they call it FOMO. You yeah. Ever heard of FOMO? Oh, yeah. You know talk, FOMO talk about is. it all the time. So, yeah. yeah D- FOMO is tell me. driving this market right now. You know, and I have to fight that, you know, fear of missing out for the listeners. FOMO. What do you have FOMO and, about as somebody who's well, like, all, you know, just like a human being, you know, you just, uh, you know, you have FOMO. You see people making money and, all, you know, and you're like, ugh, you know. But uh, yeah, let me get more people, from my yeah. as I sit in my like if you're watching us on YouTube, you got a pretty good view. I don't even know what that building is behind you. It's absolutely enormous. <laughs> um, you know, but it's, it's the tallest apartment house in the world. It's behind me. It's on Park Avenue and 57th. It's just this spire. Yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. I, I don't know who lives there, but uh, uh, yes, I've been I'm very I'm very lucky. Yeah, and you're like on you're probably on part fifty six in park or something at that point. I won't. I don't want to dox you on a podcast, yeah. but you're not too far away from wherever that building I'm is. I'm down the block. I'm, a, I'm down the block. right, right. But yes, it you, it's an unhealthy, it's unhealthy, and and I, you just you have to. I think that when I'm in a good place, when I'm in a good place, it's it's because I want what I have. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want what I have and I want what I have and it, and we're comfortable and I have to just be, you know, it's an inside job. If you know what I mean, it's an, in, it's kind of an inside job. You kind of have to feel good about yourself through sort of yeah, self-actualization and development and growth, whatever. You know, I mean, I always, you get, self-esteem from esteemable acts, right? Don't you think? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, ideally. I mean, uh, ideally. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, I always like to say, do you remember when there was, t- do you remember the telephone booths and they used to have big the big telephone book? Yeah, like g- metal chained or whatever to yeah. the thing, yeah. So I, so I would look for a number. I'd be in the booth, right? 20 years ago, let's just say. And I would and I would see the number and I would rip the page out of the book. And that's not very esteemable. No, that kind but, of it's, but you see it in every so movie. Now, right. You see them ripping the but so at some point I stopped doing that. Right? And I went, wow, that's not nice to the next person using this book. And so I would close the book and put it back. And I would that was an esteemable act. And I would 
build my self-esteem from the fact that I didn't rip that page out of the book, you know? And so, I mean, sort of that's how it works for me. Well, I didn't do that today, you know? And I was very proud of myself. I didn't rip pages out of books anymore, you know? <laughs> got to set the and bar somewhere, right? <laughs> you got to start somewhere, right? And so, you know, it's that kind of thing, I think. So, but that makes me happy, you know, today. Like if I were to go into a phone booth and go through that whole process in my head and not rip that page out, I feel like, you know what? That's good. You know, I'm a better guy today. Did did you want to scale your business huge? Like, did, did you feel an addiction rush or a big dopamine hit when you grew the business or the bottom line of the business? Uh. It would just sort of happened and it was sort of like a big show, you know, that I was putting on and I probably over hired, you know, had a little bit more people that I needed and a little bit more fanfare, but I knew that I was building something and it just, you know, so I just kept, you know, adding and adding and it just exploded, you know, and, uh, you know, it was that, it was kind of like that. If it didn't work out, we wouldn't be talking. That's about true. That, right? Yeah, of course. I just wondered if it was always part of the plan. And, and no, it wasn't really. Okay. It really wasn't. I mean, it becomes the plan. Uh, anyway, so it was kind of like the show. I remember like early on, I would think, like, I got all these people, like, you know, I had like three extra people. It would make me insane. And they weren't busy or something, you know. You run, you have a business that made me, you know, if, and I would see them. I go, oh, God, what a you know, it looked like a big hubbub, you know? Yeah. But the buzz. So, so you kind of got a, you kind of got swept up in that and you're growing the business. And then of course, eventually get punished. We'll get to that in a second. Cause I want to get some of the details on that. I do want to go back to the shoes and the designs and the customers. Cause I've heard you say seeing a woman wearing your shoe out in public is like hearing your own song played on the radio. Sure. T yeah. Tell me about great. that. Like a, a Did great, I say that? That's great. I, or somebody wrote, whoever wrote the book wrote it. I think it in I there. said it. I might've said it. No, I helped write it. We wrote it, but I, I, it's true. It is so true. It's, and the thing that I said in the book, so, you know, just now I remember it was seeing a great shoe. Well, it is true. It's like, that, that is true. And I've been, I used to just freak out when I saw somebody wearing my shoes, but now everybody wears my shoes. Mm -hmm. So, but seeing a great shoe is like hearing a great song when you're alone in your car on the radio, that tingle feeling you get when you're alone in your car and you hear that great song and you're just driving. That's what it's like for me. You know, I might've said that. Said a lot of things. Yeah, there's a lot in the book. <laughs> <laughs> whoever whoever proofread it, you know, condensed oh, it a little bit. No, no, I did. Those are some of those are Steve isms. It makes sense though, right? Like like it's a good combination of art and commerce. And I find that to be the same with 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 like this podcast. Not that it's the same thing as a shoe, but in many ways it kind of is. You know, I'll do an interview and it'll it'll get edited and, and I hear it and I go. Huh, we did a pretty good job with that. You know, like we cut out the 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 train siren whatever that was like going on behind it. We cut out the dog barking and then it all ended up pretty well. Like during in the making, you've got glue stuck to your hands. I mean, you know, not me, but you probably, you know, got glue stuck to your hands. There's some crap fabric on the bottom of your foot. Yes. It's like they say watching the sausages get made yes. is not pretty. Exactly. But they taste good at the end. Right. You know? And so that, no, that's so true. And and you hear it, you're, you're, you're walking, like I'll hear my wife listening to something and I'll be like, Oh, what is she listening to? It sounds kind of interesting. And then I'll be like, Oh, I could barely hear it, but that's our own show about our own topic. And I'm like, yes, you know, it, as long as it's not my voice, usually I can recognize my own voice, but if it's somebody else, I'll go, Oh, who is that? I, yep. I've always, uh, you know, I've always compared it to the music business, which I was fascinated with, um, completely fascinated with, um, and uh you know like with hits because we would make a shoe and it was like a hit like a song you know like everybody wore it i was always fascinated what became wh why a song you know would become a hit and uh in fact i've had big moguls 
I was so interested. I had big moguls on my board of directors mm -hmm. and two monster uh, music guys. They're not on my board anymore. On my board of directors that I met through different various things. And because uh, I was so interested in what, like, capturing that. And uh, I had this fellow named Walter Yetnikoff on my, you're too young. He was the fucking mogul's mogul, this dude. Uh, in the 80s, you know, Billy Joel, Paul McCartney, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Michael Jackson. He was the prototypical music mogul. And then I had this other fellow named Charles Koppelman, another big, gigantic uh, music mogul. And I would always be like, how do you do it? Like, what's it like, you know? Because they were like me, you know? They were just, you know, one putting one foot in front of the other. and. But somehow, like, th there is something that makes these people different. And, you know, sometimes on shows like this, we try to get to the heart of it. But it is hard to decode, right? It's very hard to decode. Some of it's habits. Some of it's just the way that these people think. In fact, I, I know that you wanted to know everything about your customers, not just what kind of shoes they liked. And I, I feel like there's something here about taking tons of little inputs that maybe you can't even quite put your finger on in order to design something for a specific demographic. How did you get the information that you wanted? Did you talk to the customers that came in and say like, hey, what music are you listening to? You know, I, like, well, how are you getting the, the data? Yeah, that's interesting. You just, you, if, you know, you, you go through influences and you sort of soak it up. And, and of course, you know, that happened in the stores a lot, in my stores. It was cool to soak up that stuff and uh through know. osmosis basically yeah yeah I, mean, I remember recently you know getting plugged into this little hip-hop thing with um my friend irv Gotti, a buddy oh, yeah. of mine and, and uh there was this <laughs> there was this artist named bobby schmurda i don't know if you rolls right off the tongue no i haven't heard of that no okay so bobby schmurda I would say I would say it was maybe five years ago or four years ago. This this guy, this this Jamaican kid, does a hip hop song and a video for like six hundred dollars, <laughs> and it it captures the imagination of the entire country, in the entire hip hop community, like nothing I've ever seen before. It might have been I wish I could remember. It was four years ago, and. He he does this hip hop song, and at the end he does this dance, right? And and apparently, uh, Beyonce did the dance at her concert, mm -hmm. right? And it just goes, people just go crazy over over the shmoney dance, Bobby Shmurda, <laughs> and uh, and I remember like getting plugged into that and how exciting it was that I knew about this hip hop song, which I you know it's not my instinct to like i would never listen to hip-hop on my own you know and so and i would go to the stores and i would play bobby Schmurda, and the kids would go crazy like how did you know about this and like it was such an interesting phenomena right because they're used to hearing like freaking like jazz smooth jazz 94.7 when they go to a shoe store yeah no they don't hear that at steve matt we're not smooth jazz people or even elevate the music you have to buy from like the music yeah. company so no, that you don't get don't. sued by the kids love hip hop music. You know, kids who buy my shoes, they just they love it. You just throw on a SoundCloud playlist in a store now, probably, and you're probably better yeah. off. It's safer. Safer than turning on Sirius XM and getting sued by R I A A or whatever the artist yeah. label. But but is. and poor Bobby Schmerda, by the way, the song was about like robbing and killing people. Uh -huh. <laughs> And he was so, people like connected with that genuineness, right? Well, he was so genuine that the guy actually got indicted for murder. No, he's, man. I think, he's in, I think he's in jail now. Yeah, you hear about that with some of these. Some but of he these... was terrific. It was great. So you you got to get, listen to this song. I will. I'll, I'll just Google it and Google will say, did you mean this? Because I'm not going to be able to spell Schmurda, but the Google will find out. No, Schmurda. It's exactly like you think. Oh, really? S-C-H-M-U-R-D-A. Okay. I probably would have thrown an E in there, but that's yeah. the thing you told me. I, 
where do you get your design ideas? Do do things just pop into your head or is it like a small kind of iterative process? And it's I know- It's a process, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It's kind of like a writer looking at an empty page and you know, have a big team and it's, I always say that uh, Steve Madden, it's like a big stew. You know, you're throwing all these ingredients and you're mixing the stew and- I know many of the designs are adapted from small run shoes that you discover overseas or, or somebody will send you something or show you something or you're maybe- Million like, different things, yeah. million things. Dreams, movies. Dreams, really? Dreams, I wondered about dreams, that. I wonder movies, if you woke up at night and you go- looking, Walking into the Gucci store. Yeah. I mean, just a million different, you know, a million different ideas. They're just, they just come from everywhere. And uh, we're trying just to make great, trendy, great shoes. If you think of a shoe in a dream, do you wake up and draw it or what? You describe it to somebody. Usually they're terrible, but my dreams are so awful lately. The, the shoes from dreams are terrible? Sometimes. Sometimes you think, oh, I dreamt about this wedge on the beach. You know, I remember that. And, uh, and then it's impossible to wear wedges on a beach? No, people no. do. Okay. People actually do. Yeah. I don't know much about shoes. It just seems harder to wear that on a beach. But what do I know? Just so many different influences. So describing it to somebody is better than drawing it out? Or are you, are you just not much of an artist? I remember seeing like a movie poster. You know, I remember the one shoe. There was a movie with Gwyneth Paltrow called Shallow How. Oh, yeah. That's a good movie. And I remember, the, and I remember seeing the shoe on the post. I said, we got to do that shoe. What is that? This is what I've been trying to get to. Like, you know, it was like that kind of thing, you know. But uh, shallow how. So you recognize it when you see it, and then you want to make some changes and make it a Steve Madden thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of that. That makes sense. I mean, there's, that, a, that, many, there's a lot of things. There's a, there's a whole book by my buddy Austin Kleon called Steal Like an Artist. And the whole idea is like, Artists are always saying like, oh, I'm original, I'm original, I'm original. And he's like, literally no one is original. So just do the, take the bits of the best things from other people. That's what real artists well, do. That's what we yeah. do. You know, so we do it. Sure. Yeah, we do it all. We do all of that stuff. And, and uh, yeah, memory. Mark Jacobs talks about memory. You know, he's a real American genius, true genius, Mark Jacobs. And uh, somebody I look up to. And uh, even though he's younger than me. Oh really? Yeah, he's more handsome than me too, which I don't like. Yeah, that's that that's infuriating. It's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, but uh, Mark always talks about memory. Yeah, you know, because it's so true what you say. You know, you know, listening again, listening to like interviews with the, you know Lennon or you know talking about like oh yeah he heard this song and he liked that lick and he would take that bit, put it in and change it a little bit and. That kind of thing. Yeah. I, I, look, even with podcasting, people are like, oh, you know, you, this is this is different than everything else. And I, all I think of is, well, I mean, I listened to like 50 other interviews to prep for this one. So are any of my thoughts even original? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> Nothing is original. No. We should have a TV show. Nothing is original. So Jordan Belfort, eventually this catches up with him. He gets indicted. There's a lot of stress, I would imagine, in your life at this point, because if you're working with somebody on something shady and they end up getting indicted, the first thought has to be, oh, crap, are they, are they collaborating with the feds against me? I mean, what, what are you feeling at this point in time? Were you suspicious that they were working against you, like with the FBI? Yeah. Yeah, that was a tough one. Yeah, they got in trouble and then they cooperated and um, and that was it. You know, I kind of knew the way it was going to go. If I'm in your shoes at that point, I'm replaying every conversation I've ever had <laughs> yeah, in my yeah, head. Yeah, all of that. I remember <laughs> hearing it and I was in the back of a car and I remember the first time I heard, you know, they're, de they're telling on you. And I remember like slinking down in the bottom of the car. <laughs> Oh, shit. I actually knew exactly what it was going to be, too. Like, it was weird how I, like, had a premonition. I was going to do X amount of time in prison. But you knew instantly, like, oh, crap, yes. I've had incriminating conversations with these guys. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, like... Oh, yes. <laughs> were they wearing a wire around me? Like, yes. yeah. Oh, my God. I had a good friend wear a wire on me on the golf course. 
Oh man, like, how oh, did you yeah, find out that it was? I did, and I found out later. You know. Oh, that makes sense. And I remember the day. You know, it was acting kind of strange. You know, but you know that was it. Um, it must be weird. How did that? I mean, this is a dumb question, but how did that feel? I mean, it has to sting, right? Because these are childhood friends. Some of these other guys that, yeah. that in the in the book, yeah. and. I suppose now maybe you understand their perspective given that they were facing serious jail time, but it's still got to be like, dang, man, we grew up together and you're talking to the feds. Totally. Yeah, it was all of that. It was terrible. It stung and it was, you know, it's like a betrayal and certainly. Not great for the addiction recovery, right? Yeah, not great. But, you know, you go through what you go through and it makes you stronger. I mean, for me, adversity has been a great teacher. You know, and uh, I have to say, uh, wasn't able to. Yeah. Anyway, it was a betrayal. I hope you never go through it. Yeah, um, I it sounds miserable, you know, reading in the book, yeah. the story, the way that you're feeling, even when you were reading that part of the audiobook, I was like, man, he still feels bad about this. Like you can I tell in your feel, voice. I, yeah, I felt bad about it. I'm not hung up on like, oh, those guys are assholes, you know, like right. it's over for me, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's past and just move on. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I suppose. Were you worried about the business falling apart if you went to prison? Like, were you thinking, oh my God, now it's gonna, I'm gonna ruin everything now? I was. And, uh, I had a lot of great people and, and uh, they kept it going really great. They did. I hired a guy at CEO and he he knew what I wanted to do. And it was very, it was impossible for me to run my business from prison. Impossible. Impossible. And illegal probably, right? And illegal yeah. and impossible. Not, not Forget about illegal. It was impossible. This guy did a great job. My buddy Jamie stepped in and and uh, Jamie Carson stepped in and, and handled stuff for me. And, um, and so I was able to come back to a, you know, not super successful business, but a business that was doing some things really well. And so I was able to step in and, you know, go to that, go to another level. So I was very lucky there. So you were sentenced to 3.5 years in prison. You did a, a couple years and a half. And, and this is this is like 2020 hindsight, right? It was for money. Uh, not much else, right? And and two and a half years—that's kind of a lifetime in the fashion industry. It's it's a it is a long time. It's a long time in any, yeah. in any industry. It's a long time, uh, and it's a long time to be in prison. And and uh, that's why I hate to see they give such severe sentences to people, and people think, oh, he only got four years. Yeah, you know, for like, like really for like selling a pound of marijuana. It's like yeah. a, a huge amount of time for somebody God. who's twenty nine. No, they used to have a mandatory minimums. Over a hundred plants was ten years. Ugh. Yeah, uh, it's so long. That's so. That's so long. It, I could go on about that, but we don't have enough time. But yeah, I've I've but, talked about that on the show before too, because people will. I said the same thing as you. Oh, he only got eight years. He's a nonviolent criminal who's thirty one. He's going to get out at forty. Like you know, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a life ruining amount of time. Yeah, and I'm wondering even though it was quote unquote only 2.5 years, right? That's a lot of time away from friends, family, business. Do you ever in your head do the calculation of the money you gained and try and match it to the time you lost? Like, did you ever try to calculate, okay, was it worth it, you know, oh, to no, go no, away? No. I guess it's a good question. All right. No, it's not worth it. And I would have gladly given all of my money up to not go to prison. I actually talked about it with my, with convicts, like in the joint. I'd say, ah, ugh. and they would laugh at me, you know. Uh, there's nothing worse than being in prison, other than you can imagine what would be worse. Right. But, but uh it is a truly horrible, uh, I, I, I can't, I tried to convey it, uh, the awfulness of it and, uh, the awfulness of it is not actually being in the prison, you know, because human beings, we make the best of every situation, right? You know, I mean, we get a routine and you survive, you know, and, uh, but it was just, being in prison and being away from the world, you know, knowing that the world was going on and you were stuck in your little cell and 
you know, while the world was going on and it was like you were dead and everything was moving along and people were meeting other people and people were doing business deals and people were having children and people were dying. And then you were just, the light, the world is moving and you're sitting there. And uh, I can't explain the heartbreaking feeling that was on a daily basis was, was like, it was like my heart broke every fucking day. And uh, just, I can conjure it up in my mind. It's just this horrible thing. And and actually, you know, I do my workouts. I read my books, play a little cards, laugh with the guys. It wasn't awful, you know. I mean, it's awful compared to our lives today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, you get used to your routine, you know. You're surviving. You're trying, to, but but I can't. It's just terrible that the way that the guards, the people in the prison, treat you so badly, like you're not even a human being. I couldn't believe, you know, how badly I was treated. Oh, by the guards. Yeah. 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 Well, not just not me. Everybody. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a Steve thing. I mean, it was. It was some of the guards treated you like you weren't a human being. It was really crazy. <laughs> it was a crazy experience. You know, they treated you so bad. You know, it was, I get the, I, there was a show that sort of captured a little bit of it called Orange is the New Black. Mm -hmm. Not really, not the whole trip, but that was as close, that was close capture of it. You know, and I, I would watch that show and I would feel these girls, you know, it was only a TV show, but God, that pain, I know what they, you know, they did a nice job on that show. It must be an interesting perspective because I, I, and I've heard you say, and I'm paraphrasing here, the differences between other prisoners and me were negligible. I think I just had better opportunities. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I mean, I was fortunate because a lot of, if you white collar guys uh, had a tough time because some of them were lawyers and they got disbarred, and stuff like that. And then, you know, dope dealers, uh, the guys I was with, particularly in the black community, really had uh, a lot to deal with, you know? And uh, they, I really, first of all, they got so much time which was one, that's a separate subject, but uh, they really go back to tough neighborhoods and and it's just a tough, it's a tough situation for them. And uh, yeah, they don't come out to like a hundred million dollar shoe companies generally. No, they do not. No, for sure they do not. And it's, that's true. And it's not, it's not a funny thing, but I just, it's a heartbreaking situation and uh and uh, we don't have enough time on this podcast yeah. to really deal with it. But there were really smart dudes I was with that just the opportunity wasn't there or circumstance, you know, wasn't there. And uh, some of the very smart, clever guys. And, you know, so I had I taught classes and I try to teach the guys, try to channel that into stuff that was legal. If you use those same sort of marketing techniques, you know, you could be successful. Yeah, like the yeah. hustle that some of these guys have. I've yeah. done work in prisons and I meet guys, I, I say this on the show all the time, so I'll keep it short, but I meet guys all the time that have really good ideas, some of which already exist in our $400 million, you know, junk hauling companies or different type, types of vendors. And there are guys that, that'll tell you stories about how they worked seven days a week selling hats on a street corner to make you know, X amount of dollars. And, and then they switched to drugs just because it was, there was more money in it. And I'm thinking if you were already working 14 hours a day, seven days a week in the rain, sleet and snow to make money, you could have been successful at anything, but they weren't, you know, and they got caught not selling hats. Right. And they, and they, they end up in prison for 10 years and then it's, it's game over. I'm wondering what, what did you learn in prison? Anything that you apply to business even now that you take with you? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, patience, patience, 
learn that for sure. Yeah, everyone's on. You're not. You're, you're on their timeline in there. That's got to be tough for an entrepreneur, huh? You know, managing your downside too. What do you mean? Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, a, a win cannot be a win. It could be just not a bad loss. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, that kind of thing. I did learn a lot there, and it was a, an experience. I know that you eventually had some kids, one of whom I just met. She's very sweet and funny. Um, yeah, she's sweet. And you can't be a selfish idiot or a workaholic when you have two little babies. I mean, you can, but it's most people don't do that, right? So I'm wondering, do you think that if you'd had kids earlier, you would have become more responsible, or do you think you would have just, like, screwed up your kids instead? I, I would say that uh, I had children I wanna, when I was ready to be a good father, I yeah. guess. I was very fortunate. I feel like I had them late. We have a, a wonderful relationship and a great, I'm so happy. I love them and they're like, you know, mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. And uh, it happens when it happens. Yeah, and, uh, I guess we don't know, but it's lucky we that don't you didn't know. have kids earlier. We don't know. <laughs> But I know that I'm smarter than I was five years ago. And I know five years ago, I was smarter than I was five years before that. So it's helpful. Yeah. So that's helpful. Me. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, I'm, I'm not a perfect father. I, I, I just, uh, my father was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> and compare myself to my dad. I was doing that this morning. I was thinking about it. I was making a sandwich for my son this morning and I dropped it on the floor and I just and I freaked out. Were, just, were you like, he doesn't know. I'll just pick it up and give it to no, him. No, no. He was watching me and he was talking about the football game tonight. And I was making this sandwich and I just dropped it. And I was so upset with myself. I freaked out. I screamed to the universe. I, and we, I went, ah, like this. Because it just plung, fell. And, uh, and then he just sort of left me. And then I just went to his room and I made fun of myself. Like I would. What can you say? I was such an idiot. I just exploded on myself. I, I always act like, oh, I don't do that anymore. And then I yeah. drop a plate and I just completely freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Irish, <laughs> the Irishman comes back out yeah. in force. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. But I wanted to, I guess what I was saying was that I wanted to, you know, sort of um, let him know that having a temper is not a good thing. Yeah. Tell me about it. My dad had a temper. I've got a little bit of a temper. And when I'm, my my wife's like, don't let any, our kid see you. I got a 15 month old kid. And I'm like, I know because it's the it's the worst quality that I have. Right. It's it is by a very far. bad. It is a terrible quality. And my dad had a terrible temper. It was, you know, the house shook. Yeah. Like he, my dad. Oof. And then I have it. My brothers have it. And it's like we're channeling our father. Mm -hmm. And it's just awful. And I, sometimes I'm really good. And then today I was just, you know, with COVID, I'm seven things on my mind and I'm, you know, late and I'm making this sandwich and then I drop it and I just fucking exploded to the universe. Like I just actually let out a, like a, 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 a an animal sound. <laughs> it's funny but, now but and, it's not funny in the moment and right? I, I was like this and I screamed right to the universe and he looked he ran into his room and like did he run in there or was he just like, like oh, he just fucking, knew. come on dad it's pastrami. I think it was all, all of that <laughs> he slithered into his room and I like I went back and I made fun of myself like he's freaking out but at the, I was just you know this COVID thing is as you know. Yeah. Well, it's driving everybody at the wall. I, one thing I noticed about you is that even after you had money, you had a family, you had brand recognition, you know, people, you, when you approach them on the street, they don't get freaked out. They said, oh, Steve Mann wants to look at my shoes. Okay. You're still grinding. You're still hustling. Did you believe at any point that you were as only, you're, you're only as good as your last hit shoe? Oh, kind of like yeah. A music I, still, artist? I still believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, I, maybe it's not true right now. I don't uh -huh. know, but I still in my, in my, in my DNA, it's that I believe that I'm always looking hunting. 
Chloe's hunted. Is it is it that, that like it's kind of like a music artist, right? They're only as good as their last hit record, and you want to stay. Re- Do you feel like you have to fight to stay relevant, or that you're fighting to stay relevant? We're fighting to make the best shoes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yes, we are. Do you ever think to yourself, this could all come crashing down at any minute? Just you know, are you, is it tenuous for you? Hey, I did, and at the moment that I started to not think that, COVID hit. <laughs> <laughs> just in case so, just in case to I keep you on to your toes it. yeah and you know what COVID has been a big blow to all of us and my, you know I have stores all over the world that were shuttered and uh, it's been quite you know quite a blow to my company of course we're going to crawl back and fight back and uh, it's been a, you know it's been a big blow and we're fighting through it and we've got a great internet business and but it's been a <clears throat> it's been really something it's i've never it's so it's mind-boggling you know it's fucking crazy e- even on a personal level do you think like okay you know my life is really good i never thought i would be here maybe it's all gonna go away no not because of covid not because of the economy but just because poof one day you wake up and it's like it, this whole thing was a dream and you're you know you're sweeping the floor someplace yeah yeah. Well, I don't think I'll be sweeping the floor. Maybe driving an Uber. Yeah. But uh, yes, I had that thought many times. I don't have it as much now. I've saved some bit of money. and <laughs> But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I thought that for a long time. Keeps me up at night or gives me nightmares. Yeah. Hope you all enjoyed that. You can find a lot more interviews like this, stuff that doesn't make it to YouTube on The Jordan Harbinger Show. It's a podcast. You can find it in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now click here for an interview with a jewel thief or former jewel thief, Larry Lawton. He stole over $18 million in diamonds and the guy is a riot. Of course, click here to subscribe to the channel.